A reading from the Hebrew Scriptures from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. Honour your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. For the wisdom of God expressed in ancient faith and commitment, thanks be to God. Good morning all. Uh, Jesus is a homemaker by Richard Rowe. In the unbearable wholeness of being, God, evolution, and the power of love, Franciscan author Ilya Dilio understands Jesus as a homemaker who gathers and heals disconnected and wounded parts of individuals and communities. The Gospels open with the word metanoia, repent, indicating a summons to a complete change of life for both the individual and society. This change is not a single event, but a permanent newness of life. Christianity is more dynamic than the classical hierarchic pyramid with God at the top, humans in the middle, and plant and animal life below. The new Christian order is not about fixity or place in the hierarchy, but inclusiveness within the whole concept of order itself. A whole larky, a system of Hollands, or parts that also make up a whole, such as a seed. Jesus' intimate experience of God and his self-identity with the Father, the Father and I are one, empower him to impact in the name of love by healing and reconciling all that is unloved in human persons. He gathers what is scattered, healing the sick, eating with sinners, speaking with women, dining with tax collectors and Gentiles, dealing with each other as one called into greater fullness. Jesus prioritizes what Delio calls a love that makes whole and heals through an ever greater unity between God, people, and creation. Jesus was a whole maker, bringing together those who were divided, separated, or left out of the whole. He initiated a new way of Catholicity, a gathering together of persons in love. At the end of his life, he prayed that there will all will be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us 
so that the world will believe you sent me. He gathered together what was divided and confronted systems that diminished, marginalized, and excluded human persons. He challenged others, not by argument or attack, but out of a deep center of love. Faith in Christ should move us to be loving and free, to create new holes, and in doing so, to create a new future for the human person, for society, and for the whole earthly community. For the love and truth in contemporary spirituality, thanks be to God. May I speak in the name of God, embodied in love, who seeks to make all whole. Amen. Two great readings. And if you look up the Richard Raw one, I do, you might like to reflect on it. Because I think it's sort of quite a beautiful expression of what I think the spirituality we share here in Pitt Street and with others in many other spaces, it's worth affirming. And that sits alongside the version, and the inclusive Bible had to go redoing it, I don't think it really quite works. That very heavy, um, important Ten Commandments, but with a very heavy voice from the top which is a little different from the holistic, the whole on God in many spaces um, dynamic. But it's holding those two things together, those injunctions which we need to hear, that voice that comes to us from the past and that which comes amongst us and it's also calling us on. So I want to begin with the Ten Commandments. Of all the critiques of the Ten Commandments that I've encountered, it was that of a 12-year-old girl which was most powerful and poignant to me. It was many years ago during a confirmation class I was running. We looked at various aspects of Christian faith and had come to exploring how to live it out. The Ten Commandments are an obvious element for reflection in this. Especially, if you're in England, as in many English churches, they were put prominently alongside the Apostles' Creed on one side, on either side of the altar, or the communion table, if you will, in our village church. Now, typically, when we did confirmation classes, and we came to the Ten Commandments, they did not evoke much reaction from young people seeking to be confirmed either because many of its components, let's be honest, such as do not murder, are fairly easily agreed. Or, most often, because young confirmands are shy about entering into religious debate with older people. There are ways of changing that, and maybe younger people today might be a little bit more self-assertive. But in general, my experience is that confirmation classes can sometimes be hard going for everyone concerned. <laughs> we haven't had membership classes with Wes and Trinity and Ron together in that sort of a way. We've explored things in a different way in that journey, but um, membership can also become a little bit too formal, I think, and when it's actually touching the spirit and heart of things and each of us in our journey, that's the important thing. So consider my surprise then when this 12-year-old girl, who even in other contexts hardly ever said a word in public, suddenly launched into an outburst full of vehemence and reason. This is shocking and abusive, she said. How can this be in the Bible? I cannot accept it. Her protest was about a number of things in the Ten Commandments, but especially the fifth commandment, honour your father and mother. How on earth can I do that, she said, when my father so mistreated my mother and left myself and my family when I was so tiny. Now, in my opinion, our young confirmand had cogency 
as well as passion on her side. We do have to interpret the Ten Commandments, as anything else in the Bible, in their context and in the light of our own spiritual experience. Many Christian leaders and traditions in history have argued that the moral law, whether you believe that philosophically as a Platonistic ideal or whatever, but the moral law is an important element, you could argue it could be applied to the referendum and things as well at the moment. The moral law as a concept is seen as above all manifest in the Ten Commandments in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and it's essential for spiritual life. So John Wesley, one of the great forebears of the Uniting Church, wrote in his sermons that every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind in all ages, as not depending either on time or place, nor on any other circumstances liable to change, but on the nature of God and the nature of humanity and their unchangeable relation to each other. However, as aspects of that language, mankind and such like, reflects, the application of divine moral law has always to be made applicable to time and place. Wesley himself, like our young confirmand, would, for example, certainly not have agreed with slavery, which is explicitly mentioned in the Tenth Commandment, condones or colludes with that structure of human oppression. Indeed, Wesley wrote a notable anti-slave trade pamphlet quite early, before Wilberforce really got going, Thoughts Upon Slavery, which, among other things, can be seen as an example of the prophetic public theology which the Uniting Church has inherited through Methodism. That prophetic public theology doesn't also stand out against slavery in parts of the Ten Commandments, but would also agree with that young confirmand that the Tenth Commandment, too, which he was also unhappy about, is also deeply sexist. Women treated as property, or like donkeys, were also mentioned in the same verse with slaves. It reflects ancient patriarchal ideas of women as property like slaves. So as Jewish and Christian traditions also amply demonstrate, including in Jesus' own debates with others, remember the debates over marriage and divorce, other commandments have to be interpreted with precise application, which is why, you know, the great rabbinic traditions, terrific wisdom of trying to understand not just Ten Commandments, but the law of God as a whole. All the world's great wisdom traditions are united in agreeing, and this is where the moral law is a truth, isn't it, for us, that unlawful killing unlawful ste stealing and misuse of sexuality are destructive. And not recognising people's rights would be another one that is pertinent to our times. But Christian and other theologians continue to disagree about how you apply some of those injunctions in specific certain situations such as war and civil resistance, abortion and end-of-life issues. Nonetheless, I say such moral law, what we might call the law, the L-O-R, L-O-R-E, L-O-R-E of love, the law of love, is still understood to be helpful and to have common resonance across the bulk of humanity. And that's what Wesley was saying, I think. So as our confirmation group found out all those years ago, the Ten Commandments can certainly still help to open up deep feelings and lively discussion, and it sets a bar for us. All of that, I hope, is part of what our prospective new Pitt Street Uniting Church members can help contribute also as they enter into, fully into the law of love that the Uniting Church seeks to live by and walk by, that they too also shape, just like the 12-year-old confirmand it's not all tidy, we have continuing reflection on what is right. 
because to do so is to reflect the heart of prophetic faith, not least, as I say, as it comes to us in the Uniting Church through our Methodist heritage. So may our new members today continue to enrich us with their own gifts, experience, and insights. And I hope and I expect they will speak up like the young confirmand if they see things differently to the things that we have inherited. Now, as most of you know, I had a go earlier this year at reframing the inspiration and purpose of the Ten Commandments for our own times. Because I agree with Wesley, it's still there, and it's still, that's why we read it. But, so I've included this in our liturgy today in the form of what I've named as Ten Affirmations or an alternative law of love. And there's some of these cards still at the back. Because rather than putting things negatively with prohibitions, that's what a sort of patriarchal voice does, isn't it? But a holistic, a more whole-making approach shifts from don'ts to offer positive invitations. Like Trinity and I would agree, for example, that maybe we should add pronouns to our badges so that we positively can affirm people's gender identity as well as their name. So these are ones that I have come up with, and they are working on, they're clearly linked to the Ten Commandments that you have. Rejoice that God is love, not the sort of, I am one God and do not have another. Yes, because love for us as human beings is an approximation to that holiness. That's what really matters, not whether or not we are a Uniting Church member, or an Anglican, or a Buddhist, or a Sikh, or anything else. That's what that commandment is about. Delight that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The image of God needs to be treasured in us. Honour our diverse identities. Acknowledge the sacredness of life. Don't get hung up on Sabbath, but do address the issues of rest and reflection that we need and peace and space for all things to live, not just to be driven by GN, GDP and all the rest. Treasure good friends, loving families and healthy communities. Take honour your father and mother beyond that, because some of us are called into families of choice about what we sang. Sometimes our families we come from are quite destructive, and we need to acknowledge that. Where they're good, let's affirm that. Where we can reconcile, let's do so. But let us be called into this family of choice that God invites us into. Nurture life-giving joy and hope. Cultivate trust and appropriate relationships. Isn't that, it's not just do not commit adultery as if there's just a few simple rules that we adopt. We know that love and sexuality are more complex. But if we put trust and appropriate relationships and awareness, then we honour what those commandments are about. Act justly, love mercy, and walk gently on the earth. Yes, remember the donkeys. They matter. Walk gently with all of creation. So that's my little go at things, and maybe you will join in or not. You might just affirm some of them if you want to. You might like to amend them or create new versions, because that's what we have to do, you know, those of us in Pitt Street and elsewhere, because our churches have lost the plot on sexual ethics and all sorts of other things. We need to be able to continue to renew this call, to renew the moral law, just as Wesley did in his own times. Because the point of the moral law, like the rest of our faith, is to make it our own, to hear the Spirit amongst us and in us and in others around us, and live it out. This is the heart of what we do, and this is what the heart of what we are called to be as we, with those who proclaim, who join us as members of the Uniting Church, join and journey onwards together as part of the wider universal church and wider family of creation. One way of expressing that purpose and journey is offered to us by Richard Raw. In our contemporary reading, Jesus is a whole maker this morning. And it's based on the reflections of the brilliant theologian Ilia Delio, who offers to us this positive metaphor of Jesus, not as the fearful voice from above, as it were, 
but as the whole maker, gathering and healing the disconnected parts of not only individuals and communities, but creation as a whole. The whole maker, making whole. Isn't that a beautiful contemporary way of approaching faith and spirituality? After all, that much-used Christian word salvation, in its Latin derivation, has close associations with salving, healing of wounds and life, making whole, making things flourish. So making whole does not avoid the genuinely difficult things in our lives and world, the, he the wounds that Christians have traditionally named as sin, and we all carry them, and our world carries them, and manifestly our nation does at the moment. But it does address them in the context of seeking reconciliation and flourishing on the basis of positives rather than just negatives and prohibitions. So I like to think that my ten affirmations are in that sense naming of positive pathways for this process of making whole in which we're all engaged and in which Ron and Wes and Trinity can help us grow. I don't know exactly, to conclude, how that young female confirmand of many years ago has travelled in her own journey of faith. But I feel she certainly had the depth of spirit, insight and courage to grow into wholeness of being and to share that whole making with others. And what I know of Ron and Trinity and Wes manifestly displays that. Depth of spirit, insight and courage. So let us celebrate these people today and the gift that they are, they are to us and the image of God, of Christ as whole maker that they call us into. May they and all of us be richly blessed on the next steps of their and our journeys. And may they and we always know that deep centre of love to which Ilya Delio and Richard Rohr rightly point us as the centre of all flourishing faith and life. In the name and inspiration of Jesus, the whole maker, the embodiment of the law of love. Amen.